need. Strengthen our faith. Give us the ability to submit to the Word, to rejoice in the Word, to worship Thee through it. And through the whole of the worship service, O Lord, magnify Thyself through the alms that we give as tokens of our thankfulness, as we sing Thy praises, as we call upon Thy name in every part of the service. Glorify Thyself and build us up. And equip us to go forth in this week as lights shining in the midst of darkness. The darkness of this world. Here too we fall so far short. As we imagine all too often that the world is full of light and glitter and beauty. When in fact it is full of death. And the only light is the light of thy word and the light of the glory of Jesus Christ as it shines forth from the members of the church of Jesus Christ. So may we be faithful in this, O Lord. Make us to be strong, to be willing to endure ridicule and persecution for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And grant, O Lord, that even through this worship service we are prepared for that. Bless us in our homes and families. Thou knowest the needs that we have. Bless us as parents, as husband and wife. Make our marriages to be strong so that we fight every temptation, so that we make every effort to have a godly marriage, a strong marriage as we seek each other in the way of seeking Jesus Christ together and so grow in our love for each other so that there is nothing that can separate husband from wife, that they live together in blessed purity and unity to the glory of thy name. And bless the instruction that is given in the home. We thank thee, Father, for thy word of truth that guides us in this way. We thank thee for the extension of our homes, for the schools thou hast given us, Continue, Lord, to bless them. Bless the teachers that are there. Give them much wisdom. And grant, Father, that they are able to bring up these children, to rear them in the fear of thy name, so that they love the truth and that they live together in the love of Jesus Christ as parent, as teacher, and as student. And that thy name is hallowed there. For sin creeps in there too, as it does in all our aspects of our lives. And all too often, the sins of the flesh rise up. Lord, grant that there is repentance in the way of admonition and discipline, so that the children there too learn to live together in the love of Jesus Christ. Grandfather, a rich measure of thy grace to our pastor. We're thankful for him, O Lord, very thankful for the word that he brings faithfully, for the life that he lives, that he lives, the gospel that he preaches. Continue to use him in the midst of the congregation so that we as a church are built up in the truth and follow his example. Lord, be near to thy church universal. Preserve thy saints in all the earth. Gather thy church out of all nations. We are so thankful that we can have the confession not only of the Catholic Church, but the experience of that, of knowing others in distant lands even who are one with us in the faith of Jesus Christ, redeemed by his blood. And continue, Lord, to gather thy church out of all nations. We pray for the mission work, therefore, of our own churches, the work in Pittsburgh, the work in the Philippines. Bless those missionaries richly. Bless their labors. Continue to use them and use their labors of all our men in church extension work. The work at Grand Valley that continues to sound forth the truth of the gospel. In all these means, use this 
glorious gospel that thou hast given to us, entrusted to our care. Use this as a power, as the Spirit applies it to the hearts of those whom thou hast loved eternally, and draws them to the light of the truth. And bless every faithful minister and missionary, and grant that the word continues to go to the ends of the earth, gathering thy church until the day that Jesus comes again and takes all his people unto himself. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, asking that as we come to thee, thou wilt sanctify us by thy Spirit. Give us the assurance of forgiveness, O Lord, for we are sinners. Our best works are filthy rags. And we would not dare to come before thee without that assurance that our sins are forgiven in the blood of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We worship the Lord in the giving of our offerings for the general fund and for benevolence.
will sing the stanzas one, two, four, and seven. One, two, four, and seven, 182. Our scripture reading this morning is Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And it's really the entire sermon, the entire chapter that is the text for the sermon this morning. Acts chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up into the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him 
Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision should, which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an angel to send for thee into his house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in, and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, And Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up and saying, Stand up, I myself am also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know... How that it is unlawful, an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto the witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. 
And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So ends, there ends our scripture reading and the text for the sermon. Beloved in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 10 records, as you can tell, the conversion of Cornelius the centurion, which is in itself, as every conversion unto Jesus Christ, an important thing. But the event has more to it than even the importance of a conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ because of the time and circumstance of the, and of the man and who he was, or I should say, what he was. He was a Gentile. Now, as you know, there were other Gentiles who had already in the Old Testament become proselytes, had become part of the Jewish nation. Some of the ancestors even of Jesus himself were Gentiles brought into Israel who had become part of the nation. But the difference is that Cornelius would come into the church as a Gentile. That is to say, he would not become melded into the nation of Israel and become as a Jew. He would not be circumcised. He would not begin to live according to the Old Testament laws the ceremonies and the offering of sacrifices and all of the civil laws that God had given to Israel. This was a continuation of the work of Christ begun at Pentecost, the work of gathering the church out of all nations. Jesus indicated that this would be his work when he had the 120, not only be filled with the Holy Spirit, but speak in all sorts of languages. He was showing to them, my work will no longer be limited to the Jewish nation. My work will be gathering the church out of all the nations of the earth. And now this truth would be concretely manifest in the conversion of Cornelius and these other folk. The Holy Spirit gives to Peter, to the young New Testament church, and to us a detailed description of this event because it is so significant, because it does indicate something of the way in which the Lord Jesus works and which we should work. He had been leading the church up to this point, gently preparing the church. First with the conversion of Samaritans. But Jesus had worked among the Samaritans, so that wasn't such a shock for the church. And then there's the conversion of the Ethiopian. But he didn't come to Jerusalem and become part of the church. He went off to his own nation. But now there would be a conversion of a Gentile who would remain in Judea, of the Italians, of the Romans, mind you, who would be brought into the church and would remain as a Gentile as part of the church in this New Testament age. All these events teach what Peter says immediately in his sermon, I perceive, I have discerned that God is no respecter of persons. But in all nations, 
those who fear him are saved. Let's consider then this text under the theme, No Respecter of Persons. First of all, the clear message. Secondly, the obedient response. And thirdly, the abiding significance. No respecter of persons, the clear message, the obedient response, and the abiding significance. The message was given by revelation from God, first of all, to Cornelius. Cornelius, a man of no small means, he was not an insignificant individual. He was a Gentile from Italy. He was a Roman soldier. And whether he was of noble birth, as one would almost guess from his, the way he conducts himself, or whether he had worked himself up, either way, he had become the ruler over 100 soldiers, and therefore is called a centurion, 100 being in his very title. These were men that were loyal to the emperor. They didn't worship the emperor. But they were faithful soldiers serving the emperor of Rome. They were stationed in Caesarea, a city that is located on the sea coast of the Mediterranean, named in honor even of the Caesars. Some people pronounce the name even Caesarea because it has Caesar right embedded in the name. These soldiers maintained the presence of Rome the hated Romans in Palestine, and maintained law and order in the region. This was a very different group, if I may put it that way, from the normal kind of person that a Jew might think, let's try to make this person a proselyte. A very different kind of object for mission work is Cornelius and his family and friends. Spiritually, Cornelius also was a very unusual man. He was evidently already a believer in Jehovah, the God of Israel. He was not a proselyte in the sense, however, that he had joined the Jewish nation. Peter mentions specifically that it was not lawful for a Jew to meet with those who were uncircumcised Gentiles. And in in chapter 11, he will be accused of having fellowship with the uncircumcised, and Peter did not deny it. Cornelius was an uncircumcised man. But he knew the Old Testament Scriptures. And that's evident from the way even as Peter would come to them later and begin to preach to them that they, they knew the Old Testament. He could preach with that understanding. He was a man, therefore, whose heart had been touched by the grace of God. He had been prepared for the preaching concerning Jesus Christ. In the first couple of verses, he is described as a man who is devout, that is, godly. A man who feared God with his house. It wasn't a matter of him being only concerned about himself, but his family was very concerned. He instructed them. He led them in the right way in the truth. We read that he was, that he had given much alms to the nation, that is, to the people of the Jews. He had given much money to assist them in their poverty. He was not ashamed to tell others of this God that he worshiped. He told soldiers so that a number of them also had come to the faith through the witnessing of this Gentile to soldiers out of Italy. And he prayed to God regularly and diligently through all times and in all the events of his life he was praying. And prayer is worship. Consider that now. He worshiped God daily in his home. He would ask God for forgiveness. He would beg for God's favor upon him and his family. The Jewish hour of prayer, one of those hours is the ninth hour, and we, that's the time when the evening sacrifice was offered, and so the Jews would come to the temple and pray there as well in connection with the sacrifice. 
And the ninth hour of the day finds him praying, as was obviously his custom. And at that time, God came to him in a vision. Now, what is a vision? A vision is different from a dream. In a dream, one is asleep. In a dream, though one appears, so to speak, in a dream, when God would use a dream to reveal something, the person would be simply receiving. God would speak, and the person who saw the dream and heard the dream would simply receive it and then wake up, and God would cause it to be remembered, and he would realize this is a word from God. But a vision is different. In a vision, a person is awake, very conscious of what is happening, and he takes part in the activity even of the vision. Most often this happens when there is a very high spiritual level of the person. He is almost outside of himself from a spiritual point of view. And in the spirit, he sees things, and he hears things, and he can touch things and be involved in the activity of the vision. It's as if God opens his eyes to behold something that he would not otherwise be able to see. He beholds, for example, angels. And others who might be there in the same room cannot behold it because God does not open their eyes to see these things. But he is very much involved and active in it. You think of Abraham and his vision where he even killed animals and divided them and made a pathway through which God then passed and Abraham fell down to worship. This was part of a vision that Abraham received. And so now God comes to Cornelius. Peter's trance, by the way, later on in the chapter, is another vision. Both Cornelius and Peter received their visions at a time when they were praying, and that's no coincidence. The connection is that they were both at that moment spiritually very close to God, and consciously standing as we do in prayer, as we ought to in prayer, consciously standing before the very presence of God and bringing their worship and their words of supplication to God. And it's exactly at that moment that God gives a vision. Now, you may say, well, I've never had a vision when I pray, and I'm, and I'm going to tell you, you never will. You never will. Because God doesn't use visions anymore nor does he use dreams. And that's because he has given us a finished revelation. He doesn't need to come to us any longer by visions and dreams. He comes to us through the Holy Scriptures. But in this day, the Bible was not complete, and in this day, God would still come to them in terms of dreams and visions. In the vision, therefore, that Cornelius received, an angel came to him and spoke his name, and he was immediately afraid. Sinners always are. When they stand in the presence of one who is from God, and the holiness of God and the glory of God shines forth from that heavenly visitor, a sinner will always be immediately extremely conscious of his own sin and wonder, I am having a visit from Someone from heaven, I who am a sinner, and therefore there was fear. But, we read, the angel reassured him, he was not coming in judgment. Thy prayers and thine alms have come before God for a memorial. And you get the figure there of a king who looks over his kingdom and he beholds all the activity of the people of his kingdom and he takes notice of the citizens that are faithful, that are obeying the king's command. God took notice 
of the activities and the prayers of Cornelius. Not, you understand, as if Cornelius has earned something with God. No one ever does. But the fact of the matter is that God takes note of the fact that when the fruit of His grace becomes manifest in the lives of His people, Cornelius was living out of the power of God's grace. We don't always do that. But God takes notice of that when we live out of the power of His grace. He takes notice of that and He approves. He approves of that. And so God did with Cornelius and instructed him this way then. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Cornelius' response immediately is to follow this command. He called two of his servants and one devout soldier who waited on him continually. And he told them the vision. He recounted everything that had happened to him. And he had obviously shared with them already. They were fellow believers. He had shared with them the the truth about God. And they believed. And he sent them on the way then in obedience to the command. He sent them to Joppa, which is over 35 miles away, and it took them two days, therefore, to get there, part of one and and then the next day, traveling, we read, with great haste. It was urgent. God also gave a revelation to Peter. The circumstances were that on this very same day that the messengers were to arrive In Joppa, from Cornelius, that day, Peter was on the top of the house. Those days, the houses were built flat, and so it was common that they would use that. And Peter was up on the top of the house, and it was about noon, the sixth hour of the day, and he was getting very hungry. But they did not have the noon meal prepared yet. And Peter prays. And God sent him a vision. You might wonder why. I wondered why. Why not simply tell Peter all that Peter had to know about Cornelius, that he was to bring the gospel, that God was about to gather the Gentiles into the church, all those things that Peter would eventually find out. But that wasn't God's way. He sent a vision Because the purpose of God was more than merely the conversion of Cornelius. Peter had to learn in a very forcible way, without knowing everything that was about to happen, but he had to come to the understanding that God was about to gather the Gentiles into the church as Gentiles. He prepares Peter carefully, but he, he allows Peter's mind, so to speak, to take hold of this with a glorious picture. And remember, Peter was a Jew, and they were used to thinking in terms of pictures. The Old Testament church was a picture church, and God would come with those kinds of means to enforce, to, to implant upon their minds the truth of God's Word. And so the vision. He saw in this vision the heavens being opened. I don't know exactly what that is like, but the heavens being opened and a vessel coming out of heaven, coming down to His level. And then he saw that this vessel coming down was like a sheet that was tied at the four corners. And as the sheet is opened up, inside all sorts of animals, wild animals, creeping things, birds, all sorts of animals are found within the sheet. And then a voice comes out of that heaven that is opened, 
And the voice says to Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's response to that is that he would not even think about doing that. He must have been quite dumbfounded. Obviously, it is the Lord Himself, it is His Savior Jesus that gives him the command, but perhaps Peter thought, this is a test. This is a test whether I am truly faithful, because the Old Testament laws forbid Peter to eat any of the animals that were there. And so maybe he thought this is a test that the Lord is giving him, whether I am still faithful in everything. And he said, therefore, in response, Lord, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And then the voice out of heaven shocking him. What God has cleansed, that call not thou, and then the emphasis, there's a, you can draw a line under that pronoun, thou, that call not thou common. And the four corners are put together and it goes back up into heaven. And then the same thing happens again a second time and the same words are repeated. And then the sheet goes up and then a third time. It is all repeated for the Apostle Peter. Must have been stunned. What does this all mean? And as he's mulling these things over and we read, doubting within himself, questioning these things and being totally perplexed, the messengers come to the gate and they do not merely knock, but they call out whether there is Simon here, one who is surnamed Peter, because we've been looking for him. And Peter heard that, of course. But God prepared Peter more because we read in verse 19, in chapter 10, verse 19, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit saith unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. God makes it plain he was to go with them, not doubting that this was the right thing, not questioning it, but convinced that God had sent them by the Holy Spirit. The response of Peter to this revelation, as it was true of Cornelius, the response of Peter was he obeyed it. He agreed to go. He came to the men As he had been prepared by God, he came down to these men and said to them in verse 21, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? The men of of Cornelius must have been rather surprised at Peter's response that he would listen to them and that he would agree to come along with them so willingly. He didn't know them at all and Yet there's no argument. He listens to what they have to say, and he says, I will come. I will come. They slept there that night, and the next morning they left, traveling all one day and arriving the next day in Caesarea. We know that there were six believers that went with Peter to Joppa and were witnesses of all these things. Meanwhile, Cornelius is waiting. And knowing about when the men would return with the Peter with Peter he called together his family and he called together his fellow soldiers that believed and his friends anyone who would want to hear these were a people then you understand who were not living in their heathen dumb in their pagan religion these were a people prepared by the grace of God who were eager to hear the word that God would send them. And as Peter came into the house and up to the house, Cornelius went out to meet him and overwhelmed with gratitude, he fell down on the ground and worshipped. And Peter wants no mistake to be made, but immediately raised him up and said, I am a man as you are. 
do not worship me. And Peter spoke, telling him of what the Holy Spirit had said to him, and asking them why they had sent for him, because he did not know all the things yet that had transpired with Cornelius. And Cornelius retold the vision again. And Peter began to preach. He begins with, in his sermon with a statement which is the theme for our sermon this morning. God is no respecter of persons. Salvation is not according to class. Salvation is not according to nationality. But all those who fear God are saved. He set forth Jesus Christ, first of all, as Lord of all. Lord of all. Regardless of nationality is the implication. He is Lord of all. He's even Lord of all things. Whether people believe on him or not, he is Lord of all things. They knew some of the history. We read in verse 37, That word, I say, ye know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. They knew something. The word about Jesus had gone out. But now he says, I can tell you that the things that you have heard are true. We were witnesses of what Jesus did. That he was someone given tremendous power by the Holy Spirit, that he had power over devils, that he had power to heal those that were sick with all sorts of diseases, that he came into this world and he suffered and he died at the hands of the Jews, but that God raised him from the dead and that they were witnesses to these things. God made Peter and the others to be witnesses of all these things. And then he points out, that even the prophets of old had testified that whosoever believeth in this Jesus would receive the remission of sins. It's a marvelous sermon. It's a, it's a tremendous pattern, though we aren't all preachers. It is a tremendous pattern for the kinds of things that need to be said to people about the life of Jesus and his great power about his cross, about his resurrection, and the fact that whosoever believeth will have remission of sins. That's what he brought in this sermon to Cornelius. And as Peter spoke, the Holy Spirit was poured out on Cornelius and his family and the soldiers that were there. All of them that came to listen, the Holy Spirit was poured out, we read, on all of them. And they began to speak about God and His marvelous works, just as they had done the 120 on Pentecost. And the Jews were dumbfounded at this, that these Gentiles received the Holy Spirit just as the 120 Jews on the day of Pentecost. It was obvious that God had given them the Holy Spirit as He had done to the Jews and that He had done this as Gentiles, the Gentiles, uncircumcised, received the Holy Spirit. And so Peter asked the question, can anyone here forbid that water should be given, that they should be baptized? The answer obviously being he understood, no, of course not. No one can forbid this. And so they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The significance of this simply cannot be overstated. The significance, first of all, for the church in that day, they were being told in a most forcible way that the Jews no longer to, were to be a separate people. They were no longer the chosen nation of, Israel, uh, of Jehovah. Unto this time, all the promises had been given to the Jews. They had the oracles. They had the laws. They had the sacrifices. They had received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
And God had begun to change that, as we saw, by gathering the, Gent- the, the Samaritans rather into the nation of, of the Jews. But now it was clear that it was the Gentiles, as Gentiles, who were given the Holy Spirit. Especially significant because they were uncircumcised Gentiles. Clearly the Old Testament dispensation was over. Though God had gathered the Gentiles into the nation of the Jews in the past, always they had to become as the Jews, living under the laws and becoming circumcised as part of the nation. But God now had cleansed them. That which God has cleansed, that call not thou common. Cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not as if all the Gentiles were that. But the elect Gentiles were cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore made clean. The Jews were to embrace them. The Old Testament laws and the Old Testament ceremonies were finished, no longer in force. Now, for us, that's so well understood that our little children understand that no longer will there be sacrifices, no longer would they keep the Old Testament laws, but but for the Jews in that day, It was a bit of a shock, more than a bit of a shock, to think the Old Testament is in all of its laws and and the ceremonies and so, it's over. Those laws have been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. No longer do we live according to those ceremonies. But the point is, not only was the Old Testament dispensation over, but God would gather Jews and Gentiles into one church. They wouldn't have Jewish synagogues where they worshipped Jehovah and then Gentile places where they would worship Jehovah. It would become one church mixed together out of all the nations. United by the Holy Spirit, they would be one faith. There would be one baptism in Jesus Christ. There would be one Lord, one Spirit. With Jesus Christ, judge of all. The middle wall of partition, as Paul would write of it to the Ephesians, the middle wall of partition between Jews and Gentiles was broken down by the cross of Jesus Christ. It was taken away entirely. And forgiveness of sins, therefore, would be to anyone, anyone who confessed their faith in Jesus Christ. Anyone. The church was being prepared not only to receive the Gentiles, the church was being prepared to send the word out to the Gentiles. This is a mission instruction here that God has given It's gathering them, yes, receiving them into the church, but be ready now to send the word out. It wouldn't be long before God would exactly choose Paul and Barnabas and have the church of Antioch send them out to the Gentiles. But you see, this had to happen first. The church had to understand the the change that God made in the gathering of the church. Tremendously significant for the church in that day. But no less significant for us today. It is. This is a call for us to missions. Emphatically. The work of sending out the gospel is a very important work. Jesus made that abundantly plain when he said, Just before he ascended into heaven, One of the last things he said to the church is, Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature, because all authority is given to me. I am Lord of all. Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. 
We need to hear this. Because sometimes we can feel a little bit too much like the Jews of the Old Testament. That the gospel, after all, is with us. It's with white people. Preferably Dutch or German white people. They have the gospel. And they are the objects of mission work. And God is not going to gather very many people that are black. He wouldn't send the word out to the nation of Africa very quickly. His people are like us. And God's word to us in this chapter is, no, my church is out of every nation, every nation. All the earth must hear the preaching of the gospel. Send it out. Wherever I open up a door, send forth the word of Jesus Christ. Out of all nations, all tribes, all skin colors, all cultures, I gather my church. God is no respecter of persons. God does not look at a man's face. God does not look at a way that someone is dressed and say, oh, well, that, that kind of person I want in my church. That's not how God deals with the external. Neither may we be respecters of persons looking at the outside so that we do not judge and judge a mission field based on whether they're like us or not. I think we're getting over that. But it used to be almost that someone had to write a letter to the mission committee that sounded like they're Protestant Reformed before we would think about sending somebody there. But there's also a very practical application. And James speaks of that to the Christians in his day when he says, don't be a respecter of persons. They were respecting persons. If a rich man came in all dressed up in fine clothes, they would say, oh, here, here's a nice seat for you. You sit right here. But if a poor person came in, they would say, well, uh, yeah, go, go sit over there on the floor or, or, or stand in the corner. Don't be a respecter of persons so that we don't judge people either by the way they're dressed or the color of their skin. And that a poor, a rich man gets all kinds of attention and, and we're honored to have him come to church, but somebody that's poor or black or a different skin color, we say, well, they're they're probably here for money. And we respect persons. Instead of saying, God is no respecter of persons. I must not be either. Bring the gospel. Tell them the good news of salvation. But on a very personal level, we can rejoice with joy exceeding that God is no respecter of persons. Not only because the fact of the matter is that we are Gentiles and not Jews and God has brought us into His church, but you understand that He's no respecter of persons. He has not saved you and me because we were part of a good family. He has not saved you and me because we were doing something worthy of notice and worthy of being saved. He is no respecter of persons. You are saved because of grace alone. Now, we don't confess common grace. We confess that grace is sovereign, particular, un unmerited. Unmerited. You don't deserve grace. I don't deserve God's favor. You are saved for one reason. God chose you. And He redeemed you. And He gives you faith. He's no respecter of persons. 
Otherwise, he would have said, him? Her? I don't want them. They won't add anything to my church. He saves according to his sovereign purpose. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, what a great and glorious salvation is ours through Jesus Christ. We thank thee for this, that thou hast eternally loved us in him, and that salvation is absolutely all thy work, and that we therefore are brought into fellowship with thee in a glorious, glorious church out of all nations, tribes, and tongues. And we look forward to the day when we will all be in glory and be able to see the reality. We see so little of it today, though we confess a Catholic church. We pray for the day when we will behold that glorious, innumerable multitude out of all the nations gathered to praise Thy name in glory. Even so, we long for that day. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Psalter number 176, 176, O God, to us show mercy and bless us in thy grace. Cause thou to shine upon us the brightness of thy face, that so thy way most holy in earth may soon be known, and unto every people thy saving grace be shown. All the stanzas, 176.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.